Uh, welcome to Founders Friday. This is a tell all for anyone that is interested in learning how to produce revenue for your companies. Our theme today uh, is product led growth, which is pretty consistent with our recent episodes. Uh, today's episode is a little different though than the ones that we've done prior to this one. Uh, this episode is one of a series with VCs that invest in product led growth. And my guest today is Jason Mendel at Battery Ventures. Hi, Jason. Hey, Asim. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, Jason is, uh, invests in early stage companies uh, as well as growth investments in cloud infra, data, security, and enterprise applications. Uh, his recent investments include Arise, Cypress, and Postman. Uh, Jason, thanks for joining us for this Founders Friday webcast. Uh, we are we want to dig in deep with PLG uh, with you. We want to understand how PLG companies are redefining the way SaaS companies have operated for a long time. In particular, we'd love to understand how we now write product, how do we sell it, how do we deliver it to customers in this model. Uh, and our goal is to educate as well as to entertain. So let's keep our, pun uh, our responses punchy. Let's have some fun with it. Uh, you know, our audience would love to hear what's your secret sauce uh, as, as, uh, as a VC as, as you think about uh, investing in these, in these areas. So let's go ahead and have some fun. Let's start with first understanding who's Jason. Let's start with a little bit of your professional profile, uh, both, of course, uh, at uh, Battery as well as prior to that. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so I guess the a little known fact about me is I actually started my career working in the mall at a company called Hollister. And so uh, the first real experience that I had with product was folding shirts and jeans um, as a high school student. Um, after that, you know, I started in investment banking at Deutsche Bank, um, then moved to the investment side of the world, uh, and did a, after that did a stint at Cisco on their corporate development team, um, focusing on a lot of infrastructure, security, um, but really around this whole migration towards the cloud and SaaS products that they're going through. Um, and joined Battery about a year and a half ago. Awesome. And, uh, you know, as I was going through your profile, I noticed that uh, you went to Harker, uh, which is a pretty well-known school here around the Bay Area. Uh, but then you yeah. also became a math tutor for a while. Tell us a little bit about that. Where did that come from? Um, so I actually, I had a lot of odd jobs uh, during college. One was tutoring math. Uh, the other was coaching high school and middle school wrestling. I was a baseball coach. I worked in the mall, um, but I've always really enjoyed working with kids and kind of teaching and coaching. Um, and so that's what that ultimately stemmed from. Um, I also love math and was always really interested in math and science. And so um, it was an easy way to make money, but it was also something that I really enjoyed. Um, so I kind of naturally fell into it. Very cool. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, of course, your career at Battery. You've uh, started that about a year and a half ago. Uh, tell us uh, what areas of investment that you tend to focus on and, uh, you know, what sets Battery apart from other venture funds that attracted you to, uh, to come work there? Yeah, so, um, you know, Battery has been around for a while. Uh, we're a stage agnostic fund, so we do everything from early stage to growth, which I think it's pretty unique and gives us a lot of flexibility to get in early, but also support companies throughout their entire journey. Um, I got into venture investing. Um, I think a big part of it was the people aspect for me. Um, I think it's an amazing opportunity to interact with a lot of really interesting founders with different perspectives, um, but also explore um, a bunch of different spaces um, and dive really, really deep, which I've always liked. Um, I like how thematic it is. I like how thesis driven it is. Um, and there's a lot of self exploration that goes into it. Um, so for battery in general, I think the biggest differentiator for us is that we have a team of domain experts with a lot of operating experience. Um, we like to be involved with our company. So we help with go to market. We help with um, things in terms of hiring, everything like that. But the biggest piece is that we have a team of domain experts. So um, I work closely with uh, the ex CEO of MongoDB. He kind of scaled that business from five million to um, 100 million. Uh, work closely with the ex CMO and one of the early co-founders of Palo Alto Networks. Um, and so people with really deep domain expertise that have had a lot of experience um, scaling businesses to you know public market scale. And so. We're able to provide a lot of operating advice along the way, um, but also help our portfolio companies with strategic decisions um, and really anything they want. Awesome. Uh, very cool. And 
you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your investing approach uh, for you personally. So, you know, before an entrepreneur uh, approaches you, what should they know about you in terms of how you like to invest and, and what do you look for uh, in companies or in teams as you, as you engage with them? Yeah, I, th I think the biggest thing that we're ultimately looking for is passionate founders with a deep understanding and unique advantages in the spaces that they spend time in. Um, so what really gets us excited is working with someone with an awesome vision um, that has a deep understanding of what they're doing. Um, we also love large market opportunities with kind of an acute pain point, but really it's the founder and the vision that get us excited at the end of the day. Got it. Got it. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, Jason. And I'm curious, you know, uh, some of the venture uh, firms run uh, EIR programs where they invite entrepreneurs to sort of partner with them early on. Uh, sort of pre-seed stage to explore ideas and, and build, uh, build out a new company. Uh, is there something similar or akin to that at, at Battery that uh, our audience should be aware of? Yeah, we have, a, we have a pretty extensive EIR program. So like I mentioned, um, two directly on my team, one was the ex-CEO of MongoDB. Um, the other was the ex-CMO of Palo Alto Networks. Um, and then we also have some that are more on the operating side. So we recently brought on um, the uh, ex-chief revenue officer of Pendo. Um, and so they're really involved with our portfolio companies post and pre-investment with things like go-to-market, hiring, um, pricing decisions, things like that. So really it's the, the fact that they've been there and done it before and can help with decision-making along the way. Got it, got it, very helpful. So I'm gonna switch gears a bit. Um, I'd love, love to talk to you a little bit about product-led growth. It's obviously something that has entered the vocabulary in the last few years. Uh, you mentioned uh, Bendo and uh, you know, uh, one of their execs uh, or previous execs on your, um, uh, on your, on your team. Um, you know, product data has become obviously fairly relevant uh, to how SaaS companies now operate. And uh, we'll come to that, but let, let's just first start with how you view product-led growth and how, what's your definition of it? When you, know, when you search for companies to invest in, uh, how, do you, how do you sort of filter them based on uh, certain criteria? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think it ultimately comes down to two key things. Like one, um, the product is at the forefront and the focus is now on the user and not the buyer. And so I think what we've seen um, it's just this broad consumerization of the enterprise. And so customers today demand better experiences from their products. And so ultimately now what we've seen is companies are starting to sell to the user versus the end buyer. And that's what catalyzes the whole PLG motion in my view. Interesting. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting the shift that you define is as sort of a natural extension of the consumerization of, of B2B software. So when you think about it from the buyer's lens, right? Uh, and you know, I've experienced this in my previous role at a big company uh, where you start to uh, engage with a, uh, you know, a product and before you know it, your entire team's using it. Uh, and that's when the CIO or the CTO or somebody from procurement steps in to figure out what that contract should look like. So how does this change the buying cycle? from uh, the perspective of uh, you know, the companies that consume these technologies, how does that change as, as PLG proliferates more and more across, uh, uh, across organizations? Yeah, I, I think the biggest misconception with PLG is that you don't need a sales team. Um, and so what it ultimately does in my view is it changes the, the point at which you engage sales. And so what's unique about PLG is value is delivered before there's a commercial interaction. And so, Customers get on the platform quickly or adopt the product quickly, can use it in a free um, or unpaid capacity. And then ultimately you wanna use usage um, data to figure out who has a high propensity to spend, who's getting value from the product. And then from there you can engage the sales team. So it's just a different point at which you engage a sales and marketing team. Um, and it's a different person that you operate with from the beginning. Got it. So, so uh, that makes sense. I think uh, I think your key point here is that uh, the the sales team needs to engage at a different point in the cycle, and it's usually after there's some adoption and validation by the end user, which is sort of the exact opposite of how traditionally SaaS software has been sold, where a sales team comes in, demos to decision makers, make a call, and then it starts. You know, the software starts to proliferate inside the organization. Um, 
obviously this changes the dynamic quite a bit between how companies buy and how softwares consume. Um, you know, how do you see this evolving? Like where, you know, and what does it mean for, for buying organizations? Like what do they need to start thinking about differently? Uh, and, you know, cause you, 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 you hear a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, particularly when you talk to CIOs or, you know, people responsible for making purchase decisions, feeling like things now slip under their radar and it throws their budgets off a little bit. How do you, how do you sort of respond to that audience? Like what, how should they be, how should they be thinking about as they, as they look ahead uh, and more and more software sort of starts to approach them in this way? Yeah. I mean, I think for, for consumers of enterprise software, um, it's changed the dynamic a lot. So I think historically it was one person making the decision for many. So you would ultimately sell a product to a customer who would roll it out to all of their end users. But today, I think what you've seen is the power is with the user. And so like there are a lot of cases where product-led growth doesn't work. Um, but for the cases where it does, I think it's for things where there's an acute pain point um, across a wide range of users. And someone is able to get onto the platform, use the product, find value with a lot of, without a lot of different engagement. And then ultimately, their pain point um, drives an enterprise sale. And so I think that it just changes the dynamic, the purchasing dynamic where like the user and the practitioner is the person that's ultimately making the decision to buy the tool that they want to use versus someone else forcing them to use something that they don't necessarily want to use. I think, I think the way you express that makes a ton of sense that, you know, the dynamic has shifted towards the end user uh, making the call on what they want to use and then and making that making that buying decision effectively. Um, so you also mentioned there are certain areas where PLG may not be relevant or may not be applicable, that not every product can be sold in this way or, or uh, approached in this way. What are some examples where, or where would you kind of draw the boundary around PLG? And what are some of the things that make sense when you're inside of that boundary? And what are some of the things that make sense to be outside that boundary? Yeah, I, I think the biggest, thing that PLG needs to have or for PLG need to work is the user has to have influence over the buyer. And so where that, where that interaction is disconnected, it doesn't necessarily work. Um, the other thing is it has to be a product where someone can, or the user specifically can realize value independently and quickly. So there doesn't need to be a lot of onboarding supports or kind of post um, usage support. Um, and, it has to be ultimately something that's simple without a lot of explanation needed. And so if you just look at infrastructure software, so data developer tools, security, things like that, um, I think we've seen a lot of PLG take place in the data space, um, in, the, in the developer tool space, but it's less of a security use case today, in my opinion, because that's still more of a top-down enterprise-wide sale. Got it, got it, okay. Um... Super helpful. Um, so let's maybe shift gears and now look at it from the lens of the SaaS companies, right? So obviously any new company that is being formed today or has formed recently is asking the question, why not PLG first? Um, and so what advice would you have for companies that are just starting to build new product, you know, particularly from a product design standpoint, what's different uh, or how should we be thinking thinking about product design in the PLG context? Yeah, I, th I think what's different is ultimately simplicity um, and ease of use. So that has to be the focus. It has to be something that's intuitive for the user to pick up um, and use, and then time to value becomes even more critical than it already is. Um, you wanna make sure that it's a seamless and amazing user experience that someone can onboard quickly, use it quickly, find value quickly. And then ultimately share it with other people. I think that that's the one thing that's often missed is the virality aspect of PLG because your users are ultimately an extension of your marketing team. And so when someone's deriving value from the product, they're going to tell their friends, they're going to tell other people in the organization. Um, and that's ultimately how you drive awareness and build a big community around your product because that's ultimately what's important is building mindshare, building community, um, and becoming the quote-unquote standard of excellence. So that, that's very helpful. And I think uh, you, you called out simplicity, ease of use. You talked about sort of, uh, you know, designing for, for virality or sharing inside the organization and creating that, that amazing uh, experience that encourages people to, to share with uh, their colleagues and friends what, what they're working on. 
how do you, uh, can you share some examples for, of, of sort of designing for virality? That's not necessarily the, uh, I mean, that's obviously in the consumer domain or in the social media yeah. domain, very well known as a concept, but in the enterprise domain, that's not how most uh, product people think. So uh, what are some examples or what are some of the principles behind designing for virality that, uh, that uh, enterprise product managers should be aware of? Yeah, I think, uh, I think a good one to look at is Dropbox and, and what they did early on. So they made it really easy for people to get on the platform. And then it didn't just stop there. So once people were on the platform, they made it easy to share files, collaborate across users, and it became embedded into the everyday workflow of that person and almost integral into what they were doing. And that's ultimately how I think you drive one um, virality and sort of widespread adoption, but also longevity and, and staying power. Hmm. Got it. Got it. So, um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit on the product side. Uh, you know, let's maybe shift gears and talk a little bit about on the go-to-market side, what's different the way that uh, PLG uh, products can be taken to market. Um, you know, one myth that we hear pretty consistently is it's just free trial. What's the big deal? Uh, love for, you know, for the audience to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the free aspect is certainly a part of it. Um, but it's more than that. There are a lot of different ways that you can that you can deliver the value of a free trial. So you can have free trials, you can have a free tier, it can be an open source product, but free is ultimately not enough. I think it's all about focusing on the users, the key persona and not the buyer and making sure that that user can realize value independently without having to engage with the sales and marketing team up front. Um, and then there also has to be a natural progression over time. So as you start to think about where does the user go? Um, there has to be a natural migration from free to paid where they can realize value independently, but then there are additional features or other pieces of the product that they can unlock over time with like a natural paid funnel. Got it. Got it. Um, so Jason, you know, if you look at it from, from the lens of the sales team or from the selling organization, with SaaS software, there's a pretty well-defined, or B2B SaaS, there's a pretty well-defined sales funnel. You know, you've got the MQLs and sales accepted leads and so on. And what does that look like in a, in a PLG context? Like what's the sales funnel, uh, you know, past the initial sort of try uh, phase where you can just sign up and try the product and, and get a pretty uh, uh, visceral experience of what that might feel like. What happens next? Kind of walk us through what you think that funnel should look like and how's it evolving? Yeah, so I, I think I think you're right. It starts with ultimately free signups and usage. And then from there, once you have a user on the platform, you should be tracking the usage um, pretty heavily. And once they reach a, a certain threshold, which you define as almost a product qualified lead where your product is qualifying whether or not someone has a high propensity to spend based on their user engagement data, um, then you decide to engage the sales team after you have that already product qualified lead. So. I think historically it was marketing qualified lead, sales qualified lead, and start the funnel broad and kind of get more narrow. Um, now you're letting your product qualify your lead. So there doesn't need to be a person that's engaged at, this, at the beginning of the cycle. Um, and then once you've qualified that lead, you engage the appropriate sales team and help people navigate the free to paid conversion funnel. Um, and in theory, you should have a much higher conversion rate because you're dealing with people that are already finding value in the product. And so, you know, it's working for them. It's just about satisfying their future needs. Got it. Got it. Um, and, you know, you touched on this a little bit earlier about uh, that, you know, the myth about not needing a sales team is not necessarily true. Like you do need a sales team to engage in, uh, and take clients through, through the sort of the commercial part of the journey as well. Uh, what's the, as, as startups scale and they're sort of approaching the market through a PLG motion, what's the right time for the founders to start thinking in terms of uh, putting a sales team in place? Like, you know, you don't want to be too early, but you don't want to be too late either. So what, when's the right time? What are some of the signals that founders should look for uh, as they're thinking about introducing a, a sales team into a PLG motion? Um, I think first and foremost, it comes down to defining your product qualified lead. So once you understand what that person looks like, what the usage data looks like, where you have a good sense of, hey, this person has a high propensity to spend, or they're likely to convert, 
I think that's a good time to start investing in sales and marketing. Um, the other thing is just seeing repeatability in the conversion um, motion. So once you really understand the pain point and the value that the free product provides and then start to see the repeatable free to pay conversion motion, um, then it's a great time to also invest in, in uh, sales and marketing. I think the other misconception is that it stops with a PQL. And so the, the key thing about product led growth is that the customer journey matters even more. And so when you start to think about it, you have to think about post-sales support and success that continue to drive value and expansion over time. Um, because that's the beauty of the product-led motion is you can continue to nurture customers and help them um, find increasing an increasing amount of value um, over time. And so expansion, retention, success, all these things start to become really, really critical. Got it. And I, I think you just kind of touched on another interesting topic there as you as you went through that uh, that narrative around you know expansion, retention, et cetera, and renewals. What what are some of the key metrics that uh, one should be thinking about as a founder, uh, especially as you're entering that sort of uh, stage where you're trying to drive a repeatable motion? You know, so what what sort of metrics then become critical or important versus the traditional SaaS metrics, right? So. You know, we're all familiar with uh, CAC and uh, the ratios and so on. Like, what you know, what should we be thinking about in the PQ uh, in the uh, PLG context? Yeah, I think first and foremost is just your free to paid conversion rate. So understanding what that looks like and what you're trying to drive there, um, and ultimately what are the different levers that you can pull um, to drive that. And then the second piece is, um, I think, net retention is really really critical. So the interesting thing about product-led growth is I think customers tend to land at maybe a lower ASP, which means that they have a lot of potential to expand over time. And so net retention is ultimately a metric of how much ongoing value your customers are realizing. And if you look at the best companies in the public market, they've consistently been able to deliver 130% plus net retention over time. And so what that means is it takes some of the pressure off of your new land motion where you can nurture your existing customer base and continue to drive long-term durable growth over time with the existing plat with the existing customers on your platform. Got it. Uh, very interesting. I think the, you know, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, just rationally to look at it and say, what's my free to paid conversion? And then what's the net retention and growth uh, or expansion in that account uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, I want to shift gears again and uh, talk a little bit about the role of data, right? And uh, certainly, uh, you know, I'd love to get your perspective on when you think about, uh, when you evaluate startups, you know, what sort of um, data are you looking, uh, you expect the founders to be uh, collecting and gathering in order to understand their business better? Uh, what do you see different in the way that PLG companies are operating with respect to data? Yeah, I, I think so. One of the biggest challenges for organizations is data silos today. And so I think what we've seen is you know, the past three to five years have been focused on getting all this data. We have more data now than ever before, um, but it's now stored and siloed across a bunch of different, uh, across a bunch of disparate sources. And so companies are really struggling to create this holistic picture of what's going on. Um, and usage data becomes really, really critical for the PLG motion because that's ultimately what indicates a person's um, propensity to buy or to convert from free to paid. And so the issue is data isn't synonymous with intelligence. And so you need the tooling and infrastructure um, in order to transform that data to intelligence, but also present it in a way that the sales and marketing team can consume it and make decisions from it. And so it, it comes down to one, like unifying the data across the silos, and then two, translating it to intelligence, and three, giving that intelligence to someone that can take action on it. Got it. Uh, makes sense. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, so I think, I, I think your point about, obviously, uh, I mean, uh, Marissa, we fundamentally believe product data is a goldmine for signals uh, for the sales and service teams uh, or any customer-facing function, but historically it's been, uh, you know, very useful for, for product teams, uh, for engineering teams, but not necessarily available outside of, of those organizations. So we kind of tend to think that think of that as the dark data problem, right? The data is available, but it's yeah. dark to the organizations that need it in order to drive revenue and, and some, some momentum. So what, you know, 
love to hear your thoughts because like obviously you know you mentioned uh you guys are close to pando and and some of the uh one of the early uh companies in this domain that uh made product data a thing uh in in, in our vocabulary and so what what do you feel like are some of the challenges around getting access to that data particularly if you're on the in a customer facing function yeah so i think the i, I think the biggest challenge is that again, it comes back to the data silos. All of your data isn't in one place. And so there's pockets of intelligence that are stored across different applications, whether that's um, Salesforce, your marketing software, things like that, um, that you need to unify that and provide a holistic picture of the customer in order to make that decision. Um, the other issue is how do you fit it naturally into the sales person's workflow? Um, because everything has to be aligned with the way that they do work. Um, and then it's about translating that data to intelligence. So data points um, don't mean anything unless there's intelligence associated. So how do you take that data and make a decision um, from it? And I think data is the biggest indicator of usage today. And so it's all about taking that product data, translating it to intelligence, making decisions and figuring out who's the right person to target and why. And so that's ultimately where I think things are trying to go. I think a lot of the focus today has been on qualifying what a PQL looks like, um, but there's ultimately a lot of data that goes in after that point. And so in an ideal world, your sales team, your marketing team, your customer success team, your support team, and your product team should all be in sync to deliver the same value to the customer. And so how do you give the right piece of data to the right person along that flywheel to make sure that they can use that in a way that's actionable, um, and in a way that improves the overall interaction. Got it. Got it. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, Jason, what you're describing, you know, perfectly resonates for us as as we're talking to companies that are in the PLG space and building solutions to to help address some of the problems that you just described. I think what's interesting is, uh, so we are currently tracking a list of a little over a thousand companies that we would consider as. Uh, the, um, uh, engaging in some level of a PLG motion uh, in their in their product design and their go to market and so on, and I'm curious. I mean, obviously, this thing has become a, a movement in of its own right over the last few years. Where does it lead to from here? Like, what's next, right? So, um, as investors, you're always looking around the corner. So, what would you share with uh, yeah. the audience? Like, what? How do you see this evolving? I think, so I touched on this a little bit. I think it's ultimately how does it expand beyond the initial piece of the workflow that qualifies um, a product led lead. And so what's really interesting is how companies expand across the tool stack to address the problems that customer success has, the customer support has, um, ultimately billings. And how do you ultimately tie everything back to product development? Because that's the key driver of product led growth is how do you continue to innovate and address the needs of your end customer or your end user in order to keep that flywheel motion going? So it doesn't just stop at the PQL or once you've identified um, the user, it's how do you measure their engagement over time? And then how do you tie it back to the different functions within your go-to-market um, and product teams? Awesome. Uh, Jason, this has been uh, fantastic. Every time we talk, I learn something new. Uh, and so... Yeah, likewise. Really, well, I mean, you know, what you covered today in terms of the metrics really summed it up for me in terms of, you know, for as founders to kind of focus on that free to paid conversion and figure out the repeatability pattern there and then to focus on net expansion because you are starting with a smaller uh, early sort of uh, adopter uh, cycle and the, the goal should then be to how do you how do you create that expansion. Um, any any uh, final thoughts uh, for our audience in terms of you know just sort of netting out some of the discussion we've had today? What are some of the key takeaways you'd like to leave them with? Yeah, I think I think the biggest takeaway um, is that the user should be front and center. So everything that you should everything that you should be doing and every the key focus up front is on the user and making sure that they have an amazing customer experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second piece is the sales team still matters. It's just a question of when do you engage them? Um, and then the third piece is that post-sale, there's still a lot of work to do. And so it's ultimately a question of how do you maintain engagement with your customer to make sure that one, they're an extension of your marketing team, but two, they're kind of 
continuing to realize value and that you can continue to grow that relationship and expand them over time. And so it's an ongoing thing. It's not a point in time. Um, and I think that that's the biggest um, advantage of product led growth is it really focuses on the customer relationship um, and it provides an opportunity to create something that's lasting and valuable. Awesome. Uh, Jason, so uh, I'd love for you to share with the audience if uh, any one of them needs to reach out to you, what's the best way besides LinkedIn, of course? Uh, yeah, you can email me at jmendel at battery.com. Great. Uh, Jason, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as always, uh, you know, learn something new and uh, walking away with uh, some takeaways as a founder on how we should be thinking about how we run our business. Um, we at Immersa are, in fact, helping solve some of the problems and challenges related to PLG. And uh, every time you know, we, we have one of these conversations, we learn some uh, new, new sort of concepts that help us uh, continue to make our business better. So if anyone that's watching would like to engage in that dialogue with us, uh, we'd welcome for you to reach out to us. You can reach me at a scene at immersa.ai. Um, and we'd love to talk to you about how data can help drive uh, revenue for your PLG business. Jason, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you as well, Sam. It was a pleasure.